let's look in our Bibles. Let's Matthew 7. We're staying in Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7. I want us to understand what God tells us about salvation. Because we have to, once we understand the, the, the principle that God lays out, then we will, by God's grace, will not seek to do anything that will add to what God said is perfect and cannot be added to, neither on the opposite end, neither can anything be taken from it. What God says is true. He says it's perfect. You can't add to it, and you definitely can't take away from it. But too often, we find the latter more pertinent or, or more relevant in our day. We find people trying to take away from God's plan of salvation. Thursday night, we looked at the principle when we saw how, how Simi, Simeon and Levi. Now, Levi was through Levi came the tribe of the Levites. These were the ministers of the church. And we find Simeon and Levi coming together and con con concocting a scheme to bring in the, the, the Shechemites in um, Genesis chapter 34. And his purpose for bringing these heathens into the church, so to speak, becoming one with the church, was for, was for the havoc of wreaking revenge and profiting off the goods of these heathens. And the heathens as well saw that they could be profited if they would simply join this band of individuals by circumcision. We saw that circumcision in the Bible, those who were here, represents what? Baptism. Baptism. So these two individuals come together and they give and they say, well, the only way you can really be a part of us is you have to be circumcised or you have to be baptized. And so the men got together with the people of, of, of their city and said, yes, we'll be baptized. And they were they were uh, circumcised. And after three days, Simon and Levi came in, destroyed the city and took all the men, uh, took all the women and the children and all their goods out. And so now the church, quote unquote, is prospered because these men lowered the standard for circumcision or for baptism. Because circumcision was given by God's people for the purpose of what? Sanctifying, Sanctifying but it was a purpose of, it was a sign, better question, it was a sign of what? Sign of the covenant. It was a sign of the covenant that he made with Abraham, remember? He says, your male is to be circumcised. What day was they to be circumcised on? The eighth day. And when you look through the Bible, eight symbolizes a new beginning. So circumcision was to symbolize that you, was having, that you were going to have a new experience. And so what happens is these men were circumcised, but they did not have a new experience. And Levi and Simeon brought these things in. And then Jacob, being the chief man, Jacob looked and says, hey, what you guys done were wrong. And then we find in the next chapter, chapter 35, God spoke to Jacob and God said, Jacob, go back to Bethel. What was Bethel? The house of God. The house of God. That was where God first met Jacob in the wilderness. And when he let the ladder come down from heaven and that ladder symbolized Christ. And that was to be, as it were, the gate of heaven. And so God told Jacob, <clears throat> he said, get you back to Bethel, go back to there. And Jacob said, I'll get there and I'll erect an altar. But he told all these Shechemites and all these new people, as it were, that came into the church. He says, before we go, you need to get rid of those strange gods. You have to change your garments. Because I understand that these two preachers lowered the standard to bring you in. But God has a standard. Amen. Yes. There's a standard that God has to be a part of his church. And Jacob said, the standard is you got to get rid of those gods and you got to change those clothes. And the people gladly gave him those gods. And the Bible specifies what gods they were. It says the gods that were in their ears and the gods that were in their fingers. So they gave God those earrings and they gave God those jewels. 
And Jacob took them and buried them under an oak. And they went to Bethel. Now, I want you to notice what the Bible says here, because this is what we see then from Genesis is what we see God simply reiterating. And what part of me, what John the Baptist iterated, what Jesus reiterated and what the disciples confirmed. That there's only one way, brothers and sisters. To get into the kingdom of God. And it is by giving our hearts to Jesus. Notice what your Bible says in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, looking at verse 13, when you have it, amen. amen. The Bible says, enter ye in at the straight, narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth where? And many there be which go in thereat. Verse 14. Because straight is the gate, and what? Narrow is the way which doth what? And few there be that find it. Now, the Bible lets us know that when God speaks twice, he establishes the thing. And God establishes the fact here that the way to eternal life is straight. It is an austere, it is a, it is a difficult way to receive eternal life. Why? Because self does not want to be in the presence of God. Self does not want to surrender. As you looked at your handout and we saw it, self is our greatest enemy. And there's no more precious victory that we can gain is the victory over self. Now, I want us to go back in our Bibles. I want to look at this from the beginning. Because, brothers and sisters, we have to understand that God has set the way of salvation and we cannot alter his plan that he has devised to save us, to separate us from the world. The three angels' messages identifies a people who have separated themselves from the world in every particular, not just in their mental assent to truth, but in their lifestyles, their habits, their practices, they have stepped away from the way of the world. And they are now become consumed with the things of God. The things they once loved, they now hate. The things they once hated, God, they now love. And they find joy in the word of God. But there has been for years a dumbing down of the truth. Because the church and the world have been trying to figure out, and not so much the world, but the church has been trying to figure out, how can we come close, so close to the world and still be called a 501c3 and get all the benefits of a church? How can we get so close to where we'll be with them, but we still won't lose our benefits as being a church? And brothers and sisters, it almost appears as though churches are just simply modified nightclubs. To where people in the world can look at themselves, entertainers see themselves as being ministers. There are musicians who say that what the minister does in his church is no different than what I do on the stage. He says, hey, after all, I preach, they preach. He says, uh, uh, people, when they listen to me, they wave their hands, and when they're in the church, they wave their hands. He says, I charge people to see me, and the minister charges people to see him. He says that we're not doing anything different. So therefore, I'm a minister. But is that what a minister is? To get people to wave their hands? Put money on the offering plate? Well, that's what some of them do today. But God has called his people to be peculiar, to be different. Let's look at this. You're in Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter, as a matter of fact, before we go here, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Let's go in our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 28. 
And let's notice something here. This is, this takes place. Now, again, these are things are new and they're old to some. But I pray that as we go through these principles that we'll be able to understand and be able to share with others our peculiar traits of character that God has called us to play, to be. We are to be peculiar. And brothers and sisters, I want to tell you that you can go from one Seventh-day Adventist church to another and the standards will differ depending on what church you are in. But one thing that you must know is consistent is the word of God. And that's what we are to live by, not by the culture of the church, the standard of the word of God. And what we live by, the church did not give it to us. God did. And therefore, the church has no right to alter it. Neither by committees, neither by 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 votes, they can't alter what God has established. Notice what it says. You're in Ezekiel chapter 28. And I want us to look in verse 11. Ezekiel chapter 28. And looking at verse 11, and when you have it, amen. Notice what the Bible says. It says, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a what? Lamentation. What is a lamentation? Moaning. Moaning. Take up this, this moaning, this sorrow among the king of Tyrus. And say unto him, thou, thus saith the Lord, thou what? Sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been where? And eat in the garden of God. Now, wait a minute. God in his word moves from Tyrus. And who is he now focusing on? He's focusing on Satan. But what type of, what type of, what type of letter or, or message is this? Is, is it a message of joy? It is a what? Lamentation. It is a message of sorrow. I want you to notice this, brothers and sisters. Notice what it says. It says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the burrow, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and the gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets, and of thy pipes was prepared in thee, in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that cover, if I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till what? Iniquity. Till iniquity was found in thee. Verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. So here we find God mentioning this sad case concerning Lucifer. That his heart and iniquity was there, but this iniquity was the, uh, came from the foundation of his pride, and his pride came from the foundation of looking at who he was and what he was adorned with more than all the other angels, and his heart was lifted up before God. And brothers and sisters, you have to understand something. That the way one dresses has to do a lot with their attitude. If you don't believe it, ask some of the cover girls, ask some of the models. And what's interesting, there was a model, very famous, I don't, I don't remember her name, but she's one of the newer ones. And she walked out on this stage and she was dressed like a model. And then she says, uh, excuse me for a moment while I change in front of you. And the people started laughing and she changed and put on a, a longer skirt. Took, kicked her heels off and put on some flat shoes and put on a plain shirt. And she says, this is who I am. And then she put her picture up on the screen and she says, that's who I pretend to be. She says, but this is who I am. She says, but this is what everyone wants to be. She, and she brought out, she says, you noticed I'm not so important now the way that I've changed. And she began to just talk about the reality of what she is and what she professes to be. And she and she looked at the pose and that she had on the screen and she says and she started demonstrating how she does the pose. And she's like, doesn't that look silly? And everyone is laughing. She said, but that's what you do in order to in order to get that pose. 
She just started doing some really, you would think that this person was drunk or something if you would have saw the, what she was doing. She says, but that's what I do, just jumping back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth, and they just take a bunch of pictures and find the right one. So what she was, was not, what she portrayed was not really who she is. The clothes that she had on made a difference in what people thought about her and what she really was. So clothes, the way one dresses, has a lot to do with their attitude. And if you ever notice on commercials, when they show people dressing, they almost, they almost give them clothes and they almost make them portray as if they had an attitude because of the clothes they now put on. Yes. But I want you to understand something. That is a reality that God shows us in this word. When there is always a change in garments with God's people, there is always a change in their attitude towards him and towards his truth. It is never consistent where they change their dress and they keep the same attitude and the same posture towards God. There is always this change. Notice what it says. So the Bible says he was lifted up because of his pride. But I want you to notice what will eventually happen. Notice what it says in verse 19. Verse 19. All they, speaking to Lucifer still, all they that know thee among, among the people shall be what? Thou shalt be a terror and never shalt thou be how? Any more. Now, go in your Bible to so the book of Genesis now. Now, let's go in our Bible to so the book of Genesis. And here we find Lucifer as he was before his dethroning. He had these jewels. He had these garments. He had this outer beauty more than any of the other angels. And because of how he was dressed, his heart lifted himself up. And he says, and he put himself on a level that God did not create him. And he began to carry himself in such a way to where he led others into rebellion because they looked at who he was and how he was dressed and they followed his example. And they looked at the plainness of Jesus and that he made no pretense and exhortation of being God. And for this reason, they joined Lucifer, Satan's side, and they joined his rebellion. And so God says, Lucifer, I am going to lay thee before kings. I am going to lay thee on the ground. Thou shalt be no more. Literally, the city of Tyre today is non-existent. When, when, when Alexander came to the city of Tyre, they literally destroyed the city so bad, they literally scraped the ground and threw everything that... that uh, main, re remained of that city and they threw it in the water and today it is a place of spreading of nets the Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 26 it is a place where, where fishermen spread their nets the city does not eat there is not a piece of the city left and that shows what God is eventually going to do to Lucifer his place shall be no more I will lay thee before kings so now because of this pride issue that Lucifer has God says, I'm going to create man. But let's look at what he does in Genesis chapter 1. You know what verse 26. Go to chapter 2 and look at verse 7. Notice what it says in Genesis 2 and verse 7. We know what 26 says, that I'm going to make man after my own image. Now notice what he says in, verse, in chapter 2 of verse 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the what? dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So God now in, in opposite of what he does to Lucifer, it talks about all that he gave Lucifer. He was anointed. He was a covering cherub. He was draped with jewels and gold and God now takes the crowning act of his creation and he does what? Takes it from the dust of the ground. When you look at the rest of Genesis chapter 2, you find that all the Jews that was on Lucifer, God takes and sprinkles them on the ground. And so now, that which Lucifer is prideful about, Adam now walks over it like a carpet. 
Because in Psalms 104, he is covered with the light of God. So these Jews that Satan looked at as being so grand and so glorious that made him so great, Adam simply walks over it like it's a carpet. Doesn't even pay any attention to it, I'm sure. We are told in, 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 in early writings that in the new earth, they said the grass is going to have appearance of gold and silver blended with it. It is going to be like a carpet. It is not something that people are going to kill and steal for. And so God allows Adam to walk over the coverings of this ground. Now notice what it says. Stay in chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says in chapter 2, beginning at verse 21. Genesis chapter 2, and I want us to look at verse 21. Now notice what the Bible says in Genesis 2, verse 21, when you have it, amen. amen. The Bible says, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now what? Bone to my bone. And flesh of my flesh. Verse 23. She shall be called woman because she was what? Taken out of, man. Taken out of a man. Now question. How did Adam identify that this was a woman? How did he identify this? Now, I'm, it's, it's more of a thought question than anything. Because what happens is, what the devil tells us is that we must, women, have to, or when our babies are born, in order to identify them, mothers have to take them down to a jewel shop and get their holes punched. To identify that they're a woman. Why? Because they say, this is what girls do, Right? Well, boys do it too now, but there was a time when we would just take, they would, not we, but we would take the babies down and they would punch the little girl's ears. The baby there screaming and crying and drooling and all this type of stuff. And but they, oh, you look so cute now. Now, let me ask you a question. There's, a, there's an animal over here, a kind of vicious little pit bull. Now, what type of dog is it, male or female? Don't you don't really know yet, right? But there's a way to find out. You, you can look at the animal and say, wow, that's a male and that's a female. Some people can see it from afar and say, man, that's a female dog or that's a male dog. Doesn't have earrings, does it? But you can identify it. So, brothers and sisters, we don't need artificial garments to identify who we are. Amen? Amen. Don't allow people to insult our intelligence by saying you need these things to identify you from someone else. No, when we understand the origin of jewelry and all these things and of dress, then we will see that, wait a minute, God has given us a standard for how we are to dress. He shows us what we are to wear and what we should put on because God wants us to be distinct from the rest of the world. Satan wants us to model his attire. Satan wants us on his fashion runway. Because he is proclaiming to God, Lord, these people that you've made for your glory, they're mine. By the show of their countenance, we witness against our profession. Now, I want you to notice a change that takes place here. Now, the Bible says in verse 25, notice what it says in verse 25. The Bible says, and they were both what? And the man and his wife and were what? Not ashamed. Wait a minute. So the Bible says that, 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 that they did not have on artificial garments. They did not have on any of these jewels that were sprinkled on the ground. They did not have on artificial clothing because they were covered with the light of God. Psalms 104, verse 1 and 2. So I want you to write these things down, brothers and sisters, because again, God would have his people to be teachers. What was that again? Psalms 104, verses 1 and 2. Because you're teachers, brothers and sisters. When you leave this place, because as I said before, you spend more time out there than you do in here, amen? 
And every day you're teaching. So if someone comes to you, then you should be able to give them a reason of the hope that lies within you with meekness and fear. Be ready always, the Bible says, to give an answer of the reason that is within you. Now notice the point. So the Bible says they were both naked and were what? Not ashamed. Not ashamed. No mention of a wedding ring. No mention of any identifying mark to symbolize something. God was their identity. And what happens today is we are being or we have been bamboozled into thinking that we need these things to show that God is doing something for us. But if any jewel that we should wear, it should be a crown. Because that's where we're really going. Amen. That's where we want to go. So God's people should walk around with crowns on. But we won't do that. Because it's not fashionable. Now watch this. Notice, they're not ashamed. They don't have anything on, but they're not ashamed. Notice, chapter 3. Now we notice what happened when the serpent came in. He lied to Eve. He lied to the church. And he made the church believe that they needed something more than what they had. And the church went for it. And eventually, verse 7. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. naked. And they did what? Sewed so fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, brothers and sisters, let me ask you a question. What does an apron look like? One side. You know what the apron looks like. As, as I heard a preacher say, arms out, legs out, back out, watch out. <laughs> That's what an apron is. And so what happens is, you find Adam and Eve clothing themselves, but they're leaving parts of their bodies exposed. Are you with me? They're leaving their body exposed. Now, these are two people who have a massive mind. And brothers and sisters, I really believe that while they were sewing in the midst of getting their garments together, God came. And caught them unawares. Because though it was in the full light of day, the Bible says they were in darkness. And Jesus caught them unaware. And so while they were putting these aprons together, God comes into their midst. And notice what it says. The Bible says in verse 7, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife did what? hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, where, and said unto Adam, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was what? Naked. Naked. Therefore, Adam is ashamed. Before he wasn't ashamed to be in the presence of God, but now he is ashamed. He's afraid. Does he have clothes on? Yes, but does in the presence of God, he realize he's naked. naked. Physically and spiritually, he is bankrupt. And God, now watch what God says in the next verse. And he said, I heard thy voice and I was afraid because I was naked. Verse 11. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? naked. Now watch this. Hast thou done what? Whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not? God said, wait a minute, who told thee that I was naked? Hast thou eaten? So his nakedness is, 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 is linked with his rebellion. The way he is now dressed is in connection with what God told him not to do. And brothers and sisters, when you start seeing the dress change, it is a sign of rebellion. We are living in an age of rebellion. We are told in the spirit of prophecy that the very air we breathe is filled with rebellion. Unconsciously, seeds are being sown in our minds to rebel. And if we are not careful, then we will find ourselves on the opposite side. And when God comes, we'll say, Lord, Lord, but didn't I? We'll be in rebellion to God. So we have to be very careful, brothers and sisters, and we must make sure, is it according 
to the Word of God. So Adam and Eve have changed their dress, and has their attitude with God changed? Is it still the same? No. What are they doing? They're blaming each other. Ultimately, who does Adam blame? He blames God. Lord, the woman that you have made, so therefore I should not be punished, what? You should. I, don't, I shouldn't die for this sin. You should die. So now Adam and Eve, because Eve turns and said, Lord, you made the serpent, therefore you should die. So guess what? Adam and Eve are at this point linked up with Satan. All three of them together desire the overthrow of God. You find the false prophet, Adam. You find the beast, the serpent. And you find the harlot, the church, 666. All of these powers are arrayed against God. And it is a sign of rebellion, but God has to do something in order to save them. Because the reforms that God is now going to bring in their life, he does not begin with the dress. Because for God to clothe them would be a mockery to their sin-sick souls. What does he do? Notice what he says in verse 15. He says, and I will do what? Put enmity between the between thee and the woman, but, and between thy seed and her seed. So now God says, I have to start with the gospel. Because we remember from Thursday night, we understood and we studied that when God says, in thy seed, what is he doing? He's preaching the gospel. So Jesus recognized that the first the first step in, to reform is not the dress or the diet, but it is the gospel must come to the heart. And so Jesus says, I will put enmity. So he preaches the gospel, but notice what he does in verse, in verse 17. Notice what he says in verse 8. Well, let's just jump down to verse 18. Verse 18, the Bible says, thorns, are we there? Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat what? Thou shalt eat the herb of the field. You can still hear me? Okay, amen. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Now, prior to this, who ate the herb of the field? The animals ate it. If you go to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 30, I believe it is, you'll find where God had given the herb of the field, he had given it to animals. And so now, God has to reform Adam's diet. He has to reform Adam's diet. And so now Adam, health reform comes in, and he changes Adam's diet, but he does not give Adam flesh to eat, amen? Right. But he simply reforms his diet. Now notice what happens in verse 21. Verse 21, notice what he says. Verse 21, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make what? Coats of skin and did what? Clothe them. So God has to strip this apron from them and has to give them something that will cover them. Are we together? So right here, after sin, God implements, he preaches the gospel, he implements health, and he implements dress. Health and dress. In order to restore them, because God now is sending them out into the world. They're leaving the garden, but God is not. But God says, you cannot go out there naked. Are you with me? God said, I can't let you go out there dressed like that. Even though there was nobody else on the outside. Now, some would tell you that there were other people, but God said, no, I can't let you go out my house dressed like that. Amen? Amen. And so therefore he clothed them and then they went out. Now let's go in our Bibles to the book of Exodus. Let's go to Exodus 19. Let's go to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand something. And that is <clears throat> the dress the diet and all these things are not to be made an issue because once the heart is changed, these things will change. Are we together? Yes. 
So it's not to be made an issue. It's not something that we are to harp on. You have people that harp on dress. You have some people that harp on diet. And, and that's their pet peeve. And they talk about diet, but they're over here doing something else that's objectionable to God. And then you have someone over here harping on dress, but they're over here eating something that's objectionable to God. So you have, everyone has sort of what you call their pet peeves, all have their place. But when the gospel is preached in its purity, these things will be dealt with, but they will not be harped on. As though these are the only things that pertain to salvation. But we have to help God's people to understand that God's way is straight and it is different from the way of the world. When you are baptized into other churches and denominations, when you come to that church, the first place they take you is downstairs to the treasury to make sure you can pay tithe. Because that is their message. You have some that will go that that the minute you want to be back, the minute you desire to be a part of the church, they'll immediately take you to the store and try to change your clothes. You know, the holiness churches back in the days, I don't know if they do it now, but they would have that holiness blanket. And when people would come in and they were not dressed right, they would that those older sisters would take that blanket and would wrap it around their waist. But the idea, again, is this. There are standards and we must uphold standards, but we must recognize that when a person is not dressed appropriately, remember, we're liable to misconception. Remember, yeah. we're liable to think something that it may not be. This just may be the environment that the person has come up in. Then they have no idea. They had no desire to offend. So we have to be very careful in how we approach people. But there are cases where people know the truth, but refuse to do it. And that's rebellion. So it has to be taken case by case. Did Jesus okay adultery? No, when the Pharisees came, he said, man, you, have, you, 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 you don't know the scriptures, neither the power of God. And he began to talk with them about adultery and about separating from their wives. But then when the woman was brought in adultery, what did Jesus do? Jesus says, woman, where are thine accusers? None, Lord, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus didn't talk about marriage and don't do that. No, he said go and sin no more. Case by case but the principles stay the same. Are we together? This is why we must pray for the Holy Spirit. So we must deal with truth as it is truth. Exodus 19. Here God's people are coming to Mount Sinai. They have been brought out of Egypt. They have come out of this Egyptian lifestyle and God is now dealing with them as he deals with children. And he says in Exodus chapter 19, looking at verse 10, notice what it says. Verse 10 and 11, and then we'll jump down to verse 14 and 15. The Bible says this in verse 10 of Exodus 19. And the Lord said unto Moses, go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them do what? And be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Verse 14, and Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they did what? And they wash their clothes. And he said unto the people, be ready against the third day, come not at your wives. Now I want you to follow this point. Now go over in your Bibles. To chapter 32. I want you to go to chapter 32 now. Chapter 32. I want you to notice what the Bible says. Now the Bible says sanctify them. Wash their clothes. So when God comes down on Mount Sinai. The people are in a sense ready to meet God. Amen. Amen. They are prepared to endure God's presence. Notice what it says in Exodus 32. We're looking at verse 1. The Bible says. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us what? Make us what? Gods. Make us idols. Make us something we could bow down and worship. Make us something that we can, we can, we can look to for comfort and for strength, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the want, the golden earrings which are in your 
ears and in your, uh, of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me. And all the people broke off their golden earrings which are in their ears and brought them unto Aaron and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, watch this, these be thy want. Thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Wait a minute. Where, what was their gods? These earrings were their gods. These, these things that identify the Egyptian lifestyle. These ornaments is what they fashioned this golden calf after. And he said, these are thy gods. Now notice, brothers and sisters, watch this. And the Bible says, and when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it and made and, and Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat, to drink. And what did they do? Rose up to play. Rose up to play. Now, I want you to jump over to verse 15. I want you to jump over to verse 15. Because what happens is, while this is going on in God's presence, Moses is up there talking to God, and God changes the conversation and says, Moses, you need to get down from this mount. These stiff-necked people have fashioned themselves a God. And Moses begins to wrestle with God, as it were, in the mount, and he sends Moses down, and Moses is coming out of the mount in verse 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mount and two tables of the testimonies were in his hand. And the tables written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other, were they written. And the tables were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God, graving upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the what? No. Noise of the people as they shouted. He said unto the Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. Verse 18. And he said, it is not the noise, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that what? Seeing do I. So he says, Aaron, listen, you've lived in Goshen your whole life. I lived in the palace. I know Egyptian worship when I hear it. You've been sheltered by living in Goshen. I had to live in the king's palace. I know what dance hall music is. I know what, 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 what soca and what these love songs. They could put Jesus' name in it all they want. I know what it is. Because I've been there. And every time I listen to it, it takes me back there. I don't care who did, how many times they mention Jesus. Because remember, these, they were singing and they were worshiping what? They're God. And Moses says, no, 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 no. This is Egyptian music. I don't care who they're praising in the midst of it. This is Egyptian music. And this is what we have to understand when we listen to music in the church. It could have Jesus' name on it. Brothers and sisters, that sounds like a familiar tune. Something that they used to play at the club. And unfortunately, a lot of it, they're still playing in the club. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, one day I was, when I was in New York, I had moved back there. And a friend of mine who is now in the entertainment industry or the, the, the music industry, I hadn't seen him for a few years. And he went to my cousin's house because he heard I was back. And, and, and my cousin said, well, he's not here. I'll take you to where he is. And so they jumped in the car. And my cousin said, you know, if Tinsley was here, you had to turn that rap music off because he don't listen to that no more. And this was a conversation they were having. And they told me about it later. So when I got to the home, I see him and I run and we hug and we talk. And he backed up. And he said, oh, wait a minute. What's this I hear? You don't listen to rap music no more. You know, you grow up in New York. Hey, rap music is, hey. It's part of everything. Well, since I hear you don't listen to rap music no more, I said, no, nah, I don't listen to it. He said, do you listen to Kirk Franklin? And I said, no. He was like, oh, man, I was about to say, if you listen to him, you still should be listening to rap music. Mm. Now, this is a person that's not even in the church. Doesn't make no pretense of God. 
and could look at that and say, that's not God either. That belongs over here. I don't care whose name you put on it. I don't care how much about God you talk about and how he... No, brothers and sisters, when it belongs to the devil, it needs to stay with him. And what's happening is we're taking the world and we're taking the church and we're trying to forge and merge and make a marriage, brothers and sisters, that in air time, God is going to come and sever between the righteous and the wicked. Those who serve him and those who serve him not. Now watch this, what it says about these Israelites. Watch this point. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, now this is Moses now. Moses comes down in verse 19. And it came to pass as soon as the people came unto, into the camp, unto the camp, that he saw the calf and what? Dancing. And the dancing. Now jump over in your Bibles in verse 24. And this is what uh, Aaron, now this is Aaron's lame excuse. And this is Aaron speaking. And I said, Aaron said unto them, whosoever that hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me, and then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this cat. <laughs> so we don't need to elaborate on that. Amen? Hollywood. I threw it in, and it just popped out. But then he says in verse 25, And when Moses saw that the people were? Naked. They were what? Naked. They were naked. For Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. And then Moses says, stood up in the gate of the camp, who is on the Lord's side? So now what happens is Moses looks at Aaron and says, Aaron, what have you done? Aaron, as a minister, says, I didn't do anything, Moses, the people. You know what the people, you know that they're, they're, they're stiff neck and, and this is the worship they wanted. So Lord, so Moses, this is what I gave them. I know it wasn't right, but this is the worship I gave them. And Moses looking around and he sees the people are naked. Now, wait a minute. Prior to this, Exodus 19, they were sanctified. Their clothes were clean. But now they violated the law of God and they're naked, the Bible says, unto their shame. Every time God's people change their attitude towards God and his truth, so does their dress change. So does their dress. And this is what we must understand. We're looking at the world and we must recognize that they are not where they should be because many of them ignorantly are worshiping devils. And these ministers are making them shameful before God. Why? Because many of them love to have it so. Many of these ministers love to prey on the vulnerability of these women. And they love to see them dressed in scantiness. They love to see it because they're sick in their minds. And they're preying on these young people and older people in the church. Not just the ministers, but the elders and the deacons are preying on the vulnerability of it. But if we understand the truth, Spirit of Prophecy says that, 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 that a young lady, that if a minister puts your hands, she says, turn away from him as you would Satan. She tells young men, she says, do not allow yourself to be accosted by young ladies. She says, she says even, if you, even if you have to appear rude, we ought to maintain, maintain a standard for God. But remember, standards without Christ is galling yokes. Can you imagine if a man standing before the altar and as the vows began to be read and it began to say, you must love her and cherish her and she will be the only one. And he began to say, well, wait a minute. That means I can't date Mary. I can't go. No, no, no. I can't do this. But he doesn't, does he? He gladly accepts those vows. She gladly accepts those vows. Now, do they do it because they're forced to? They do it because they love each other. We will uphold God's standards, not when we like Jesus, but when we love Jesus. It is not until God places this love in you, will you be willing to accept his standard. And that's what we must understand. We must not lower the standards because this lowering the standards is not making them love God anymore. 
But we must recognize that God has placed this standard up. And God says that when he sees the enemy coming in like a flood, he doesn't lower the standard, he raises the standard. Now I want us to deal with a few more things as we move away from this. Go in your Bibles to the book of, go with me in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel chapter 23. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 23. Brothers and sisters, we have to praise God for his word. That everything he asks us to do, he gives us a reason. You're going to Ezekiel 33, 23, and you're looking for verse 36. Ezekiel 23, and you're looking for verse 26. We must understand that God is bringing us back to a peculiar trait. Not just peculiar doctrines, but a peculiar lifestyle which places us out of joint with the world. And understand something, keep this in mind, that when you separate from the world, when I separate from the world, it brings pain to both parties. They feel the loss, and you feel the loss. We can't act indifferent. Man, these are my friends, I thought I loved them. But I've fallen in love with Christ more. And now that I love Christ more, he now gives me the duty to live for them and show them a better way. To show them a better way. And that's what God is, 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 is looking for us to do. As God began, now understand, when I changed my dress, it had nothing to do with any of these scriptures I'm showing you. I did not study in the Bible about changing my dress. God began to show me about my attire through many infallible truths. I was, be, I was standing on the corner one day with my friends and the music was playing and I had, I had just, you know, went and got some new clothes and, and I'm standing out there on the corner with them and they're playing you know, basketball and, and I'm just kind of feeling alone in the midst of a crowd and they're just all there talking and one is coming up and they're moving away and it almost looked like a party on the corner. And all of a sudden a car drove up. And stopped at the stop sign. And I looked at the car and I'm noticing, I'm saying now, the sign says stop, not stay. Why they stare, why they stopped so long at, at, a, at a stop sign? And I'm looking and I'm saying, what are they about to do? And out of nowhere, a voice said, they're looking for a Christian. And I looked down at how I was dressed. And I looked at everybody else. And I said, wow, if they're looking for one, they're not going to see it. And I just pe and then the car eventually drove off. And I went to my friend and said, hey, man, I got to go. And I went home and I got and I took the clothes off and I started looking at the writings on the clothes. And it was things that I didn't even stand for, things that I don't even believe. I had a shirt on and I was in a grocery store and the man looked at me and said, hey, bad boy. Bad boy. I was like, oh, oh, my shirt. Yeah, you know. But, the thing, but later, are you a bad boy? Or are you a Christian? And I said, wow. Had to throw the shirt away. And this is what God was revealing that you have to change, son, the way you're dressing. I had, again, I had no scriptures to prove while I was changing my attire. But I just started changing. You know what? As I changed, my friends noticed it. They started saying, wow, Tinsley. Man. They started noticing it. Because now the way I was dressing was going in harmony with what I was trying to tell them. And they were able to see a difference. And so what happens is, if a man runs up to you and says, listen, I'm here to protect you. You would look at him and say, man, what are you talking about? I don't know you, I don't trust you, but if he had a police uniform on, you would trust him. Even if he was undercover, he would pull out his badge and it would be an identifying mark of who he is. And so the same thing with us, we have a badge and generally before people hear what we say, they see what we are. And if what you're saying and what you are looking like does not harmony, it gives off false signals. 
And we might not think anything is wrong with us. But brothers and sisters, when we go back to the word of God, when we look here, rather than looking at Hollywood, we'll begin to see that there is something wrong with me. There is something wrong. I can never understand why, why a person would put on something that is revealing and then try to cover themselves. Why is that? Why, 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 why do we put on something that is very short and then walk around and do this? Why do we keep pulling on it? Why not just put on something that is what? You, have, you don't have to do that. It's like a person who doesn't wear a belt. You ever see a young man that doesn't have a belt? And he's constantly walking around doing this. And he walks like this to keep his pants from falling. And he's just walking down the street. And he's just walking. And you're just wondering, like, Chief, if you just put a belt on, you could just save the penguin walk. You could just walk normal. But they put it on, and they, just, and they walk like this. And you're wondering why a belt would solve the problem. And we see and we see people doing it. But they don't understand why. You know what? And what that tells us that their conscience is still alive because there's a sense of shame. They have a sense that maybe this isn't right. Maybe I shouldn't be dressed like this. But there are so many people doing it. It has to be OK. I know people go to church and they dress like it. It has to be okay. We have to show the world something different. You're in Ezekiel 23. We're closing. Ezekiel 23, 36. The Lord said moreover unto me, Son of man, will thou judge Ahola and Aholiab, uh, Ahalabah? Yea, declare unto them their what? Their what? that they have committed adultery and blood is in their hands and with their idols have they committed adultery and have also caused their sons whom they bear unto me to pass to, to pass for them through the fire to devour them. Moreover, this they have done unto me. They have defiled my sanctuary and the same day have profaned my Sabbath. For when they have slain their children to their idols, then, came, then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus have they done in the midst of mine house. And furthermore, that ye have sent for men to come from far, unto whom, unto whom a messenger was sent. And lo, they came for whom thou didst want. Wash thyself and did what? Painted thy eyes and deckest thyself with what? With ornaments and, and santas upon thy stately bed and a table prepared before it, whereupon thou hast set mine incense and mine oil. So here the Bible says it is talking about this abominations of this, 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 this abomination that God's people are performing. And God says, you sent and you brought these people here. And what did you do? It says you painted up your eyes. You painted up your face. You wanted to look like these fashionable people. And God says, this is an abomination unto him. We see Jezebel, the first time in scripture where we see a woman putting paint on her face. And what is she putting the paint on? She's trying to disguise herself from Jehu. <coughs> She's trying to look a particular way so that Jehu would not identify her because Jehu said in 2 Kings chapter 9, he says, they said, Jehu, is there peace? He says, there can't be no peace when, you're, when Jezebel has all these whoredoms here. And what did she do? Come out when she realized that Jehu was coming to kill her and she had no one to protect her. She painted up her face and tried to disguise herself and say, is there peace? But Jehu looked beyond all that makeup and said, throw that woman down. You can't escape the judgments of God. And so as we look at these things in scripture, we do not see these things ever once being given to God's people. This stuff is always connected with those who are against God. Ishmaelites 
All these other people often were dressed in this manner because, again, these represented their gods, who they worshipped. But it did not represent God because God said to the children of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy, he said, listen, I brought you out and you have saw no similitudes. You don't need crosses. You don't need change. You don't need any of these things to identify me because Paul says that, our, that the law of God wants to be written in our hearts. It wants to be written in our hearts. But lastly, as we close this point, I want us to notice something. I want us to notice in the book of Luke chapter 8. I want us to notice in Luke chapter 8. Go with me there. Luke chapter 8. Notice what the Bible says. Luke chapter 8. And brothers and sisters, just note. When one changes and gives his heart back to God, the dress also changes as well. It goes from one way to the other when there is a change. And you notice the changes that is made when the heart goes back. Because then we stop thinking about ourselves and we start thinking, how can I be presentable before God? How can I be presentable before God? How can I, how can I best show myself to represent the God of heaven? That's how we know because it's not about us anymore. It's about God. And notice what it says in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. We've read this before, but notice what it says in Luke 8. It says, and they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And the Bible says... And verse 27, and when he went forth to the land, to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time and did what? And did what? Wore no clothes, neither abide in any house, but in the tomb. The Bible says that we can be dead while living in pleasure. So this man is in the tombs being possessed of devils, but he has on no close. But notice what your Bible says. I want you to jump over now and I want you to jump over to verse to verse 35. I want you to ver jump over to verse 35. So now here this man is possessed of demons and de Jesus calls the demons out. Demons leave him and go into the swine. The people left, went, told the men of the city and now the people are coming back. And when they come back, they see Jesus. And notice what it says in verse 35. It says, and when they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus, they had found the one, the man whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, and what? And in his right mind, and what happens? They were afraid. This man was possessed of devils, and he was naked. And now he's at the feet of Jesus and he is clothed. So in the beginning we see dress changing. When one rebels against God, their attire changes. They begin to start doing things that, that, that God does not approve of. Either ignorantly or just in open rebellion. But generally the fashions that we hold are things that we look at the world. And we see what they are doing, and we began to fall into these practices. And the thing that I think of the most is I see some of our senior sisters starting to dress like these young ladies. And you wonder, wait a minute. The Bible tells us that when gray hair it says that's a sign of wisdom, it would be found in the way of righteousness. But yet you find people, again, we just see that society is, is, has a hold on us. It has a hold on us. And what happens is we have to look hard, fast, not in the mirror, but we have to look into the word of God. And we have to start asking ourselves, Lord, why do I do this? Why do I go through all these changes? Why do I grow to such great limps? What am I looking for? What am, who am I trying to impress? I tell my wife now, sometimes I put on stuff and she say, 
You gonna wear that? I say, hey, I'm married. I'm married. My shoes don't gotta be tied, nothing gotta be ironed. I'm married. There's nothing, you ain't gonna leave me for dressing like this. And you know, but the deep thing is, now follow the point. The, now what does that say? Is because we dress the other way, is because we are we're looking. Unconsciously, we don't even realize it. Yes, I'm not, I'm not talking about looking nice. I'm not talking about uh, uh, being decent and being respectable. I'm not even dealing with that. But we have to ask ourselves, what is the motive for the things we do? Why do we do what we do? Who are we trying to impress? Are we really trying to impress our spouse by the way we do things and we go on and look for things and say, hey, I want to be nice? Or are we really trying to impress others? And we're going to such great lengths to do it. But are we satisfied with being what God wants us to be and allowing God to give us what he wants in due time? And what he gives us will appreciate for the uniqueness that we have and the simplicity that we have in Christ. And we do not have to keep going overboard to be something that we really don't feel comfortable at being. And so we look at these things and we're looking at the world, but we're not we're not taking time to think about, Lord, why am I doing what I'm doing? Who am I trying to impress? Who do I want to impress? What do I want? And if we can recognize what it is we want, then we can allow God to change us and make us whole. And we don't have to do anything that is outside of God's word. Brothers and sisters, again, as we close, you think about how these things happen. You think about even Jesus. When Jesus was made to be sin for us, when he was on the cross, did he have any clothes on? No, he had no clothes on. But when you see him in Revelation, he is clothed down to the foot. There's a change of dress. Yes, he was made to be sin for us, and guess what? They stripped him of his garments. But when he comes back in glory, the Bible says he's clothed from head to foot. He is covered with the robe of righteousness. Now, doing what God would have us to do is more than just lengthening our skirts, covering ourselves. And dress affects men as well as it affects women. However, it affects women more. How do you know? You look at the mall and see who has more stores in the mall. What do, what do men use to sell cars? Women. What do men use to sell toothpaste? Women. What do they use to sell orange juice and everything else? It's always women that they use. Satan seeks to use women to push forth his product. Who did Satan use to get Adam to fall? It just simply shows, brothers and sisters, that Satan knows your power. He knows your influence. He knows that if a heart rightly directed would do damage to his kingdom. Who was the first person that Jesus revealed himself to after he resurrected? A woman. Who does he liken his church to? A woman. Brothers and sisters, if men could exercise half the zeal of a woman, the work would be finished. <laughs> the reality. So Satan knows the power of a woman. But brothers and sisters, God knows your power too. This is why he has likened his last church to a woman. So we don't want the enemy to use what God created us to do for him. And we don't want to use it for the enemy. Amen. We must, again, look at the word of God and look at all these things and say, wow, why do I do this? Why am I so concerned about 
cover girl? And why am I con so concerned about all this jewelry and all this? What am, who am I trying to impress? What is it for? Wow, it's for me. That's what it's for. It's for me. A gentleman came when I was in California and he said, I noticed something. I noticed you don't have on any jewelry. And he says, why you don't wear jewelry? And before I said something, he told me, he started quoting the scriptures. And I said, well, I don't have to tell you. You just told me why I don't wear it. He said, I see your point. He said, because yesterday he said, I lost my ring. He says, you know, I spent two hours walking up and down the street looking for that ring. He says, man, and I felt so naked without it. He said, I was so distraught, I took my last bit of money and went and bought another one. And I was saying to him, I said, that tells you that ring to you is more than what you think. Oh, you think it's just a piece of jewelry. No, but that's your God. Because you can't live without it. You leave home and realize you don't got it on, you got to go back and put it on. Because you feel naked without it. What does that tell you? There's a power that we don't even realize that we're yielding to. Again, the, the object itself has no power. It is just a calf, a golden calf. It is a statue. It is this, it is that. It's, it's, it means nothing. But it is what Satan has put in your mind to make it mean is what has given it life. It means nothing to you. It has no power outside of what you think of it. And too many of us think of ourselves more than we do about Jesus. And this is why the world is going the way it is. They're going to go after fashion. But is God's people going to glory in their shame? Is God's people going to be so concerned? Yes, I praise God. Yes, but they're not considering who they are. Let us pray. Father.